This is Current Yield, Grant's interest rate observer over the air, and I am Jim Grant. And with me, as usual, is Evan Lorenz, the great deputy editor of Grant's, and uh, a couple of different uh, voices today. One is our technician, our sound technician, and he is Harrison Waddell, who uh, doubles in this office is uh, doing everything else. And uh, to my right, as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, is the editor of uh, Almost Daily Grants, uh, Phil Grant, who is, yeah, he's a sweet lady, she's blood, blood relative. And what are, are uh, we have no guest guest today. We are the guest as well as the host. And the idea is to uh, tell you how um, this little idea factory, this little learn- journalistic lemonade stand of ours works. People have asked from time to time, we've been you know, doing this almost 40 years, people ask, how does this how does an issue of grants come together? Uh, you know, how many employees, uh, how many shifts do you work, uh, sources of raw material, branch offices, uh, sustainability, uh, ESG, compliance? Uh, that, is there really a Hank Blaustein? Some people ask. He's our artist. And, and whatever did happen to our publisher named E.H. Phillip? Well, all these mysteries and more will be resolved after you hear a few necessitous words from our sponsor, Indeed. Rapid growth for your business doesn't have to come with growing pains. When you have ambitious hiring goals, you need a partner to help you get there. You need Indeed. Indeed is the hiring platform where you can attract, interview, and hire all in one place. Don't spend hours on multiple job sites looking for candidates with the right skills when you can do it all with Indeed. Find top talent fast with Indeed's suite of powerful hiring tools like Indeed Instant Match, assessments, and virtual interviews. Hate waiting? Indeed's U.S. data shows that 80% of Indeed employees find quality candidates whose resume on Indeed matches their job description the moment they sponsor a job. Something I love about Indeed is that it makes hiring all in one place so easy. You don't have to make candidates jump through hoops. Indeed's virtual interview tool means there's nothing to, to download. You just click and talk. With virtual interviews, Indeed saves you time. You can message, schedule, and interview top talent all in one place. Indeed knows when you're growing your business, you have to make every dollar count. That's why when you sponsor a job, you only pay for quality applications from resumes in our database matching your job description. Visit indeed.com slash grant to start hiring now. Just go to indeed.com slash grant. Indeed.com slash grant. Terms and conditions apply. Cost per application pricing not available for everyone. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Okay, here is the here is the uh, uh, the somewhat prosaic truth, ladies and gentlemen. This this is a this is a uh, a compact organization. Uh, the gentlemen sitting around this table more or less uh, constitute the uh, uh, the employee role. I mean, how many how many employees on uh, I don't know uh, 3M like hundreds, right? Or or Facebook? At least a couple dozen. Yeah. Oh, Facebook never fires anybody, so uh, it could be uh, infinite. Yeah. Well, we we have um, there are like six of us. How can I say like six of us? Are there six of us or not in the office? Yeah. Most days. And, and um, we work at 233 Broadway. That's near City Hall, New York. We're not particularly proud of our proximity to City Hall, but that's the way the, uh, the land lays. And uh, every two weeks, ladies and gentlemen, as you may know, we produce an issue of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. It runs to about 7,000 words, which is uh, about 28 double-spaced, honestly double-spaced college essay pages. Do you have any um, waking or sleeping nightmares about the paper you almost didn't turn in that ran for about 28 pages? For the last 20 years, yes. Okay, that's a, and Phil? Yeah. A recurring, I would call and, it. Uh, Evan, uh, so uh, Harrison, you was... Uh, Sometimes, yes. Okay, so, yeah. Well, that's the life I've chosen for myself, ladies and gentlemen. 7,000 words every two weeks, and they are pretty... F- I would say that most of those words wind up being exactly where they ought to be placed. But our job today is to tell you how we go about doing what we do, what we think constitutes um, kind of the idealized issue of grants. And I'm going to say that in uh, in a short form, it... Uh, comports with the rhyme, old nursery rhyme, something old, oh, not, not nursery rhyme, on the contrary, a bridal uh, lyric, something old, something new, something borrowed, and something blue. Something old, we have uh, an historical grounding in the history of finance and especially of monetary affairs. Something new, yeah, newsletter is what the genre is. Uh, something borrowed, we are focused uh, principally, though by no means exclusively, on the credit markets and something blue, because ladies and gentlemen, we kind of like to see them go down once in a while. That's the truth of it, yeah. So as I say, every two weeks, so we published uh, when? It seems like a long time ago. It was uh, last, uh, we, pub- we published last, last Tuesday. Yeah. Oh, this is, we're coming to you on a Monday, and uh, the recent issue of Grants uh, bore a Friday 
uh, date line, and we uh, close the issue in uh, the respectable hour on that Tuesday. So it's not quite a week since we published, and looking forward to a week from tomorrow. Ah, and this is the time of uh, the cycle when we better get some ideas. So, Evan, I don't mean to put you on the spot exactly, but w- why don't you tell us a little something about how you go sourcing your ideas? Because uh, people got to know this. Okay, so l- let's start from the Tuesday where we publish. So we just published Tuesday. It is now Wednesday. So on Wednesday, I try to catch my breath, catch up on emails, but then I start sourcing for ideas. And that could be looking through the Bloomberg and creating a screen. It could be reading the newspaper. It could be looking at prices uh, on the on the screen and see what doesn't look right relative to like what I know about the economy. And what I know about the economy, I get from reading about other companies, reading the newspaper, talking to people in the industry, doing uh, research calls. Um, the sourcing funnel could be some people approach us and say, hey, this is a really interesting idea. You guys should take a look at it. Sometimes it's me calling up uh, friends and colleagues saying, hey, what do you think is interesting right now? Or what in the world just seems kind of off? Like it, it doesn't have to be actual, but what doesn't yeah. seem quite right right now? And that sometimes will lead down to a productive path. So between Wednesday and Thursday, uh, if I'm hitting my time schedule, I will have found a new idea to work on. So starting Thursday, I start uh, basically just doing due diligence. I If I'm researching a company, I put a call into the company and say, hey, would you talk to me? I start calling up their competitors. I call up um, sell-side research uh, analysts who follow the stock. I look through Bloomberg to see if there are holders in the company I've been looking at that um, I can contact. Basically, I'm trying to do you know a 360 due diligence to disprove the thesis I had. If I, if I believe a company is going to miss earnings, I'm going to try to find every reason why they're going to hit and beat, meet, exceed. And if I can't find reasons why they're going to beat, meet, exceed, then maybe it's a good idea. And vice versa, if I think a, a company is going to beat, I'm going to look for all of the, the dirt on the company. Like, why would this be a bad idea, even though I think it might actually work out? So for the next you know week and a half, essentially, I'm trying to do all of that research, learn about the company, learn about the industry, tap into anybody I know, and then it's writing a dang memo. Yeah, so Phil um, has the uh, task that uh, most days does not seem enviable, but it does seem enviable when uh, on the Wednesday when you're not doing it. That's right. That's right. That's right. But uh, so you, you you need an idea day. Almost daily grants is five days a week, except when it's not. Right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. We do uh, intend to run it every single day during the off weeks, which is of which this is one, and um, we, we we pause only uh, once the, the 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 main flagship grants has been has been published uh, for a day to similarly catch our breath and and uh, refresh the the pipeline of stories if you will. Um, so uh, from my perspective, it's, it's um, essential to have um, some ideas that a, a pipeline, uh, a few days backlog of, of, of things that are that are notable in the markets and um, and uh, that that are, are going to that I'm prepared to write about and uh, we can research those. Well, something else that uh, almost daily grants does very well is to follow up on ideas that have first appeared in grants. And so the business model, ladies and gentlemen, says the following, you pay money for grants, but you don't for almost daily grants. Oh, yeah. Is that what we're doing? <laughs> I forgot. <laughs> Everyone should read almost daily grants. First of all, the headlines are the best in this entire operation. Secondly, it's, uh, the items are immediately accessible and relevant and forward-looking. And thirdly, uh, once you start reading that, you, can have, you need more, right? You can't, That's right. You can't yeah. just read almost daily grants. Yeah, the, the, uh, the thinking is that it's a um, amuse-bouche for the, the main course that we serve uh, our, our uh, knowledge-starved readers every two weeks. <laughs> Um, uh, as we explained, we're tracking and developing existing themes from from the flagship uh, publication, yeah. and and uh, hopefully um, uh, supplementing them and improving them just a little bit. So the so uh, uh, having as uh, few employees as we do, and having none of the resources of uh, uh, the great uh, broker dealers and uh, mega too big to fail banks, we have to pick our spots. Where right? we can't just go and uh, and dive into the commonplace. We have to think about all. Oh, well, uh, one is always supposed to. Think about the next thing. Uh, we have to think about uh, what the world's overlooking, right? What uh, is uh, outside the pale of respectable thought, which is not a bad way to begin any uh, search for a potentially profitable investment idea. And in the realm of monetary affairs, which kind of forms the, uh, I don't know, if grants were symphony orchestra, the, the monetary stuff and the interest rate stuff would be kind of the, the string section, right? the, the, the monetary stuff with the bass fiddles and then. Uh, Get the violas and the cellos and the violins. Violins are um, a little bit lugubrious for some of our monetary stuff, which are more hard hitting. But um, uh, but the the um, uh, the founding premise of grants is that uh, interest rates. Uh, this is 1982, 83. That's when we dreamt up premises. 
uh, that interest rates were uh, certainly the most consequential prices in the financial economy, and that uh, they were then at historic highs. And uh, the monetary system uh, then only recently cut loose from what remained of the international gold standard was rather at sea. So I thought, and Philip agreed with me that he was then age one, but he agreed uh, that a fortnightly publication on uh, on our current interest rate and monetary drama would be uh, something that people had to have. They had to have it. I'm just, they didn't just want it. They needed it's it. It's not optional. No. And uh, actually, the need was rather slow to develop, but I'm glad to say it's rather further along now. So the, so the, uh, uh, the idea of, of monetary heresy was the, the, one of the founding precepts. And I, I'm, I'm quite happy with that. Not everything we've done has, has been... Uh, so worthwhile, I think, is, is that. But the idea uh, that we live in a world of monetary upset, turmoil, and uh, sin is the word I was searching for. That idea has stood as well. I mean, think about it. I mean, goodness. I mean, can you imagine issuing unsecured paper money? Well, in a world of Bitcoin, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Evan, so um, Evan, if, if, we, if we had to uh, divide the labors of of Grants interest rate observer, not not for the time being, almost daily grants, which has a kind of party of one. But if we had to divide our labors, you'd be the the kind of the micro guy, right? The, um, yeah. The the, uh, the 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 ticker and the Q-sip guy, and I would be the I'll be the the big picture guy. Like the, for example, in a marriage, there are some divisions of labor as well. For example, um, one could have a marriage in which the uh, the wife hypothetically is in charge of running the household. Uh, paying the bills, uh, seeing to the uh, details of the house, raising the children, etc. And the husband takes the uh, questions dealing with, uh, the, uh, for example, the, the stance of the United States in the United Nations, uh, what policies we bring to bear in the Middle East, uh, topical issues of money and banking, that kind of thing. Hi- yeah, hypothetically. <laughs> so, Evan, tell us about, to start with, an example of an idea that was pressed upon us by all corners, but did not make it into the pages of Grant's Interest Rate Observer. About 13 or 14 years ago, there was a little bit of upset in the financial system. I I think that some of you guys might have heard about it. But um, among the institutions that blew up were Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, which are the government-sponsored entities that guarantee the U.S. mortgage market. And after they blew up, the government basically took all the profits in this um, profit-sharing agreement, which was 100% for the government and 0% for everybody else. Several investors in Fannie and Freddie Securities, in particular the preferreds, thought that this was a very, very unfair division of profits and effort in the company. And they had pitched us for pretty much a decade to write about the prospects of the Fannie and Freddie Mae preferreds if the government ever started giving them back the income from those securities. We got pitched by some very, very smart people in the industry for many, many years. And I'm proud to say that I just threw my hands up in the air and walked away. It, it turns out the government likes keeping its income. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah. so I, I'm going to... Uh... Uh, I'm going to share uh, with uh, ideas that uh, one might have ignored, but went ahead with anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, I must say, this is a true confession, and, and, and would please only the paid-up subscribers of Grants now listen to this, because only you deserve to hear this confession. I mean, re- I don't mean to deny the rest of you, but okay, fine, listen up. So um, I was born uh, being rather partial to gold bullion. I thought, even then, 1946, I thought it was the basis of a, uh, of a functional and uh, an honest, yeah, to use sort of a highfalutin concept in the context of money, but I thought it was, uh, it was uh, the, the way to, uh, to build a monetary system. And uh, so I, I, I've uh, conceived this uh, interest in the classical gold standard and have uh, continued to uh, write about it, read about it, and think about it uh, for literally decades. And um, if you think along those lines, you naturally are partial to gold shares and, um, and gold bullion itself, which as investments have worked, shall we say, cyclically. Um, but for the longer term, the miners have been absolutely uh, capital spoliation machines. They have just chewed it up and spat it out, but not in the form in which they chewed it up. It's been rather a veil of tears on the whole. 
there have been instances and episodes in which this stuff is shown, as it were, unto bullion, glittered. And you're so glad you owned it. But I have been guilty over the years of, um, of overstaying and of being rather uncritical towards this important monetary asset, but not necessarily uh, a perennially repaying investment asset. So that is uh, one uh, true confession. But let us take, uh, at this juncture, let us take the measure of our monetary matters and uh, reconsider gold, gilt, interest rates, and where we go from here. Always the next thing, right, is what we do, supposedly. Yeah, it's a, always a good way to approach finance. So um, I have taken uh, not inordinate uh, pride or pleasure, and still less, ladies and gentlemen, I pledge to you glee, out of the difficulties of our central bank. Uh, what could they have done wrong that they forgot to do wrong? I can think of very few things. They uh, dogmatized about something they couldn't know. They forecasted something that was not available to be known. They, uh, they uh, misjudged. And um, they have done this recurrently. They did it from 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And then to uh, make up for those lapses of judgment, they impose QE, 0% rates, negative rates for the next, uh, most of the next 10 or 12 years. And uh, so doing, they help to foster what is now a very unpleasant and persistent inflation. And don't forget, uh, actively uh, wished, wished it to come into fruition uh, right, right before it did. Thank you. Well, yeah, well observed, well recalled. Yes, they did. They rooted it on. You had to have 2% inflation plus. And just one thing I'd like to throw out there. In March of this year, I think people are going to forget it because this year feels kind of like a dog year. The Fed was still doing QE when inflation was eight and a half percent. They were still printing money to boost the economy when inflation was eight and a half percent. Their target was two. Yeah, I, I went back and looked. I, I think that they they added nine hundred billion to the balance sheet after CPI crossed either either five or six percent, and has of course remained yeah. remained above there. And, and today, which is October 31st, a Monday, the New York Times has a new article that interviewed 10 of Jay Powell's friends who've all said he doesn't want to be the next Arthur Burns, which has to be the biggest head switch in like, you know, what is it, seven months? He's gone from basically egging on inflation to trying to become Paul Volcker in seven months. Well, as one of our speakers said at the uh, Grants Conference, we have one a year, ladies and gentlemen, and, uh, you know, next year is your time. But uh, we have one of our speakers uh, said that... Uh, yeah, he wants to be Paul Volcker, but he's not operating in Paul Volcker's world. And it's a very different one thing. There's a lot more debt. And uh, one of the things that we do every two weeks is to uh, analyze, chronicle, and review, and, uh, and, uh, and I don't know, what else do we... Uh, debt as it comes into the world. Uh, some, some, we look at bonds, we look at uh, leveraged loans, uh, we look at uh, sovereign debt, corporate debt, what have you. But uh, the uh, debt in relation to income, debt in relation to uh, uh, GDP, whatever you want to look at in, in relation to is I immense and much larger than it was in, uh, in Paul Volcker's day. And uh, uh, debt gets in the way of things when uh, fixed charges come for, uh, for example, the paying of dividends or even the paying of vendors. Or taking out debt to buy back your own stock. That's right. <laughs> well, who, who was it that said that uh, asset values are contingent, but liabilities are forever? Is that a, a phrase from the, eight, oh, yeah. the late 80s, uh, high yield boom? I'll think of this name after probably get off the air. But yes, that was a, we had, I think uh, one of our friends had t-shirts made up to that effect. Yeah, assets are contingent, debts are forever. And the fun thing about studying central banks is the mistakes from yesterday inform the mistakes of tomorrow. So they kept rates too low in the mid-2000s, which led to the financial flare-up. Then afterwards, they decided that they didn't want to have a repeat of that. So they decided to make banks as safe as possible. And how do you do that? You, you lock as much capital and liquidity in them as possible. And you also make it so banks can't let that liquidity and capital out to the markets, which then led to the repo flare-up in 2019 and led to the Fed kitchen sinking the entire economy in 2020 when uh, when COVID happened. But now that they printed so much money, that's now led the Fed to actually have to over tighten right now in order to try to get inflation back under control. But studying what the mistakes were yesterday informs what the mistakes of tomorrow will be and how, how to react. Yeah, well, this is, a, I think, particularly on display in Japan. One of the themes we're working on, ladies and gentlemen, is, uh, is the coming, we think, uh, Japanese interest rate volcanic eruption. As you know, um, as the readers of Grants are certainly aware, and the readers of ADG are certainly aware, uh, the Bank of Japan, the, uh, Japan's own Fed, uh, stands ready each and every day to buy each and every Japanese government bond, uh, the 10-year maturity, for 25 basis points, a price to yield 25 basis points, one quarter or one percent or less. And uh, it'll do that, it says, for eternity. 
but uh, at the risk of shredding the currency, the currency has been shredded. So it's, uh, uh, you know, Paul, uh, Paul Isaac, we, we, uh, Evan, we, we, when we were talking about where we find ideas, we forgot to mention our, our principal contributing reader. It's a new class of grant subscriber contributing reader. And he is Paul J. Isaac, who heads Arbiter Partners. And he sent me, I'm going to show you this, ladies and gentlemen. You have to imagine it, but I'll show it to you uh, in your mind's eye. Imagine a canoe, and there are two sets of uh, guys in the canoe, all muscular guys, uh, obviously rowers, and they're facing each other. And it's like a tug of war, and they are, and, and they're in the water, and uh, there's a starting pistol, and they paddle as furiously as they can, one against side against the other, and the side that pushes the boat either to the left or to the right uh, over the, the middle line, wins, right? So you can imagine a tug of war, two guys, two sets of rowers uh, paddling, splashing, and uh, great cheering against one another. So that's the, that's the interest rate and the currency program in Japan. But uh, so to frame such ideas now, frames, uh, ideas which on their face seem absurd, I like to go back and to uh, contrast them to uh, the classical doctrines of... Um, of equity ownership, stewardship, and of monetary order that prevailed, more or less, most of them before the First World War, when the classical world ended and the Keynesian world properly began. And Evan, you just mentioned the, uh, uh, the kind of the boomerang of the post-crisis, which crisis? The 2008 crisis, those reforms, the uh, Dodd-Frank and Basel, uh, so-called Basel reforms that uh, have had the effect of siloing, as they say, uh, bank capital where it is unlosable but also unfunctional, right? So it's, yep. yeah. So um, here, ladies and gentlemen, here is something that we have written about in the past. There's a, there was a, uh, uh, so that's, you know, Dodd-Frank, is, it takes uh, hundreds of, th- I guess, thousands of pages to uh, get this all down and uh, it's, it's incomprehensible. And it's, yeah, anyway. anyway, so th- 1842 is the year, and uh, there was a, a Louisiana Banking Act, and uh, it was, uh, uh, I think, two sides of a page. And the essence of it was that um, uh, a bank had to have a certain amount of capital in the business, and it had to have a certain amount of liquidity, and it had to have a certain uh, discipline with respect to its borrowers. And... Um, um, banks reported their balance sheets every week, and um, and the bank stockholders were responsible for the solvency of the institutions. There was, of course, no deposit insurance. Uh, but this was, the um, uh, Louisiana Banking Act was the exact opposite, the polar opposite of the regulatory regimes in place now. And when we talk about bank regulation, uh, we, I, Evan, you and I sometimes um, recall the uh, economists now at Harvard, then I think at MIT, uh, we talk about regulatory policy often. We, especially you, I mean, you can always remember Jeremy Stein's name. Think about the Federal Reserve Board governor uh, about 2011, perhaps, who said what? I think he said something along the lines of, the thing about interest rates is they're not always the best tool, but they're the tool that gets into all the cracks. Yeah, he said he said monetary policy, but he meant rates. He yeah, meant, he meant rates. Yeah, so uh, rates get in all the cracks. So what we what we try to do at Grants, what we do in this uh, typically in this week preceding the deadline, and uh, uh, that'll give us the new issue. We try to think now about how the system is going to adjust from a time of uniquely small, invisible rates to gargantuan rates, at least in the context of the past 10 years. And what uh, the system has so far delivered in that respect is the worst bond market in the history of the English-speaking world. And that was documented, was it not, in a recent issue of Grant? Yeah, that's not just some idle historical claim. That's a, that's a, not only it's a fact, it's a true fact. No, it's, I'll go further. It's extremely true. It survived a fact check, in fact. <laughs> and, and this is, I mean, how high did Volcker hike rates in 1980 and 1981? Because I think it's just amazing when you talk about the quantum of interest rates back then and the quantum of losses now, despite the fact that the 10-year yields about 4%. Today, yes. Today, it yields about 4%. And back in 1981, it yielded just under 16? 15, 15, 15, yeah. The long bond peaked at 15% in September 81. But... Uh, it's 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 uh, it's quite astounding. In in a way, some of this for me um, uh, as ancient as I am, 
to be specific, 76 years old. I got into the business as a clerk in the, uh, when I was 20 years old, um, just out of the service, 1967, at McDonnell & Company, no longer with us, is McDonnell & Company. But I was on the, when I first got to the, um, uh, as the first job on Wall Street, and um, uh, they said, the benchmark security is the four and a quarters of 92, <laughs> and four and a quarter is sensibly the yield of maturity on longer dated securities today. So I feel as if I've made a 50 or 60 year, yeah, 60 year round trip. Round trip, yeah, that's right. <laughs> More things change. <laughs> uh, but but this but we we are transiting or trying to transition between the lowest interest rates in four thousand years. That is, the, in, in, including right? how many Phil? How many uh, you kept up with this at ADG very well? How, what was the maximum number of securities priced to yield less than nothing? Oh, we got to eighteen trillion. It, yeah, and this is in two thousand twenty, I think. Yeah, right? and it was it was close to that at the end of last year too. I don't think it moved yeah. very much. But at, at the lows of rates in two thousand and twenty, I think the uh, uh, the uh, ten year yield was one half of one percent. Right, yep. right? So it's gone from one half of 1% to slightly over 4%. So that's eightfold. And uh, bear in mind, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, the last time there was a proper bond bear market that began in 1946, ended in 1981 at the aforementioned 15% yield. And it took 10 years for the benchmark security to go from two and a quarter to three and a quarter, 10 years. And this time around, uh, that same benchmark security is uh, up eightfold in uh, less than a year. No, well, well, it's, no, not, if, if we turn 2020, obviously more than a year, but uh, in the past 12 months, it has gone from one something to uh, four something, I think, right? And, and to give you a, a scope of the losses that have been absorbed from that move, I, um, I, the, the, the 30 year uh, treasuries that were issued in, in, the, in the summer of 2020, so the, of maturing in 2050, are, are trading now with a, uh, the five handle, right? A, a, a dollar price below 60 cents. This one is the one and a quarters of yes. 2050, yes. right? Yeah. I think that's called a half off sale. That's right. Well, this 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 uh, brings us a little bit into the uh, the nomenclature of risk and to conformity on Wall Street. Um, to this day, you will see in the Wall Street Journal the uh, preface, the uh, the little slogan preceding the U.S. Treasury's obligations, and they are super safe, super safe Treasuries. And what they mean is safe from default because the Fed can and indeed has done uh, has uh, printed money to a fairly well, but uh, that hardly constitutes safety either when you're looking at a 10% off sale uh, from the inflation rate. So what else? So, uh, oh, I, I promised to give the origin, uh, whatever happened to E.H. Phillip. Yeah. So when we started, um, Harrison, I don't mean to pry, but what, what were you doing in 1983? Uh, maybe a thought. <laughs> Toddlering, I think. Yeah. And, uh, well, I had a slightly more high, high, highfalutin. Well, you task, were, you were upright. Yeah, I was. I was. Uh, uh, yeah. One. Okay. So, um, but I was uh, uh, the secretary. I had then. My assistant was Elizabeth Haldigan, and she was a college student who worked part time. So mostly it was uh, me. And uh, but that hardly projected the uh, the dignity of uh, a thriving enterprise. So we had to have. Um, had to have a publisher in addition to the editor. And uh, we had two children then, um, Emily Hope Grant and Philip John Grant. And I thought, well, E.H. Philip is uh, the new publisher. <laughs> so the new publisher, E.H. Philip, I think had a 10 year, 12 year, 15 year hiatus uh, career. And um, I think uh, you know, never did get that stock. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, Hank Blaustein to wind this uh, little, it's rather a, a self-absorbed podcast, but, uh, you know, people have a right to know. And indeed, they have an imperative to know about Grant's interest rate observer. So uh, uh, every issue, uh, uh, most every issue feels, uh, you know, features uh, some input from, uh, I don't know, Paul Isaac, right? And it hardly misses an issue. Uh, is our, one of our besties. And, uh, and Hank Blaustein has got even longer tenure on this periodical than uh, Almost anybody. Hank was with us, volume one, number one. He's the artist who draws the cartoons that feature on the page one. And Hank and I began working together uh, for assignments at Barron's, where he was a, a, a you know part-time artist on assignment, and uh, I was on the staff. So that's that's Hank's story, and he is out with a with a book on uh, of his, of his uh, drawings. He's a very accomplished uh, man with pen and ink, and he's out with his, some of his drawings on uh, in book form on the, on the opera in Europe and on Italy. And you know, he's a very talented character. So what else do I got to tell you about this operation? I talked about Harrison doing everything that hasn't been mentioned previously, including running the conferences and, the, and uh, seeing that um, uh, their creditors don't come. Uh, 
wondering where the checks are and what are. I guess, I, I guess that, ladies and gentlemen, you know everything just about there is to know about grants, except what's the next issue, which is a very closely guarded secret. Even if we knew it was going to be in it, we couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we could tell each other at this yes, point. Right. <laughs> I guess we'll all find out together next week. So on behalf of my um, deputy editor, Evan Lorenz, on behalf of Harrison Medill, uh, Harrison, have you got a proper title? Uh, I think it's to be determined. Elon Musk now calls himself Chief Twit. He used to call himself Techno King, so I think Techno King is technically an yeah, open so title. It's available. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Sure. I wouldn't be so qu uh, quick to grasp at that straw, Harrison. And uh, Phil Grant, the, uh, the, uh, the great force behind ADG and its marvelous content, including its great headlines, and, uh, and me, Jim Grant. So thank you for listening to this navel-gazing issue of, uh, of Current Yield. Next time we're going to have a guest. We are, right? We know yeah, people. Yeah, probably, probably. Okay. Probably. <laughs> So until next time, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. 